All right, so uh, I think we'll get started this morning. Thank you guys for coming. Um, this morning's uh, talk is the academics uh, roadmap, uh, how to get where you want to go. We've got an uh, outstanding panel this morning uh, of uh, some extremely successful academicians. And uh, our goal for the session today is to uh, help you guys kind of uh, figure out what the, the best path is, how to make uh, good choices during uh, both uh, residency, er, early residency, even medical school. Um, to help find your path and uh, help get you on a road to the successful career in academics. Um, I'll start by introducing our uh, esteemed panel here, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Sherry Hobgood uh, as the Raleigh McGrath Professor and Chair of Emergency Medicine at Indiana University School of Medicine. Received her medical degree from University of North Carolina uh, School of Medicine or clinical training at UNC Emergency Medicine Residency Program. Nationally, she's served on multiple boards in the executive leadership role, including the Emergency Medicine Foundation, American College of Emergency Physicians, Society for Academic Emergency Medicine, and the SAEM Foundation. She's been recognized with multiple awards, including the uh, American College of Emergency Physicians Outstanding Contribution to Education, and is a named fellow of the um, uh, International Federation for Emergency Medicine. Uh, Dr. Christine Babcock, on the end there. Uh, she's an Associate Professor of Medicine and Program Director at the University of Chicago. She received her MD at the University of Wisconsin, her Master's in Threat and Response Management at the University of Chicago, and completed her Emergency Medicine Residency Training at the University of Chicago. She's served in such varied roles as uh, Board of Directors for the Illinois College of Emergency Physicians, an invited lecturer for the ASAP Teaching Fellowship, Staff Physician for the 2008 Beijing Olympics, and in a lead physician role for the Haiti Relief Task Force uh, through the University of Chicago in America and Red Cross Katrina Disaster Relief Effort. She's also received numerous awards for her research and mentorship. And then finally, Dr. Andrew King is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Assistant Program Director, Medical Education Fellowship Director at The Ohio State University. He received his Bachelor of Sciences from Youngstown State University and his MD from uh, Northeastern Ohio University's College of Medicine. He's an inaugural board member for the SAM Resident and Medical Student Committee. Uh, serves on the Council of Emergency Medicine Residency Directors Best Practices Committee and as a program mentor for the Academic Life and Emergency Medicine Faculty Incubator. Uh, he's a nationally recognized presenter in the areas of flipped classroom learning and technology and social media and medical education and has numerous publications in these areas. So I think you've got a uh, great panel up here to answer some of these questions. Um, we want this session to be uh, about you guys. So we've prepared uh, some questions that uh, I think will help get the discussion started. but. Uh, I'm going to try and roam around, and uh, if you guys have questions, please feel free to uh, raise your hand at any time, and uh, please uh, get, get your contributions in there. So um, I think we'll start with, uh, with this one. Um, what can residents do right away to help uh, set them up for an academic career, something you know, even in medical school or uh, early intern year that, uh, that might put them on the right path if they're thinking about academics? So I'll go ahead and start out. I would say that uh, really exploring the different aspects of emergency medicine and really identifying what makes you tick and what's your, what's your big interest, what makes you excited to wake up in the morning and come to work, I think that's probably step one. And then really working with a mentor and really identifying how you can expand your portfolio in that niche. And I think that really sets you up nicely <coughs> Um, with a good sort of portfolio that you can show future chairs and academics when you're looking for a job. Look at what I've done in education or ultrasound or EMS, what have you, and that shows that you have a specific role that you can provide a department. Um, is this, okay. Um, I definitely agree with that. I would also say just get involved, right? So there's so many ways that medical students and residents can get involved in different organizations within their own institution. Um, if something interests you, like, oh, I think I might like ultrasound, join the committee, right? That's how you learn about things. That's how you meet people nationally. That's how you can kind of start this path because ultimately, you're gonna, you want to find, and we'll get to this, but you want to find an area in which that really is what drives you, that makes you excited, that makes you passionate, and you want to put your work and energy into that. But sometimes when you're first starting out as a medical student or a junior resident, you don't necessarily know what that is yet. So take the time to explore all those different options um, and learn what those different careers are like. And then kind of once you figure it out, join something, get involved, you'll meet people, they'll help you through. Yeah. And to build on that, 
Yeah, and to build on that, I guess, I would um, uh, say set some goals. So what is it that you actually want to get out of your residency training? If you're really interested in doing academics, you need to understand what the coin of the realm for academics is. Certainly that's um, somehow to demonstrate your scholarship so that you can begin the process of um, establishing a track record of productivity and contribution. And so setting some simple goals that are proximate um, to you is very helpful, I think. And then figuring out um, what kind of tools you need in order to be successful in those domains. So as you work through some of these things and as you're exploring, um, even if you decide you don't necessarily like what it is that you're doing, try and figure out what you are actually learning from that and, and catalog that in your mind as a particular you know, set of um, tools and skills that you're actually acquiring. Um, and so I think that that's actually uh, really then drives into what my next advice is, is to write. Um, really begin the process of learning to write um, and, and trying to, try just writing simple things. Write a blog, um, write a paper, write something. Uh, craft your emails carefully. Think about writing. Uh, learn how to um, really express yourself and in the written word because I think that that is kind of part and parcel of one of the essential tools and skills um, a successful academician has. Yeah, that's all excellent advice. I love that. Um, so everybody likes to talk about mentorship, get a mentor, you need a mentor to succeed, um, but I don't think people really talk about kind of the mechanics of, of how this works. So how would you guys recommend residents uh, identify uh, and then uh, link, get linked up with and then get the most out of their uh, mentor-mentee relationship? Well, I mean, a mentor-mentee relationship is work. Um, it's, I'll use the analogy of marriage. It's not, um, you know, you can't just fall in love and that's it, and then, then you, um, and and that's it because it, if it is then that'll pretty much be it it'll peter out after time um, so I think the the main thing to, for you to realize is that a, a mentor mentee relationship actually requires some work and don't um, be surprised if your mentor tells you I need you to do X Y or Z da 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 and then you go and do that and then they'll critique it and you will advance um, it's not necessarily a friendship it can be a friendship but I think People think that you're going to be besties, and that's not necessarily what you're going to be. You're going to be a mentor and a mentee to that person, and that is, a, is a, I think, an important distinction. You may very well become friends, and you probably will become close um, if your relationship is successful, but it, it, it is a different type of um, relationship in that space. I'm going to get my coffee from Courtney, so please. Courtney is my hero. She knows I need my caffeine. Thank you, Courtney. Awesome. Yes, thank you, dear. Thank you. I'm, I'm just, sorry, how many medical so students are in the room? Oh, my God. Can I have some coffee? Courtney? How many residents? Junior faculty. Okay, so a bunch of things. Because I think, like, the mentor-mentee relationship changes mm -hmm. as you sort of go through your careers, right? So when you come in as a junior faculty member, you may not even have a mentor that's actually in the area of interest of yours, right? And some people would argue you should have people outside of that to be able to kind of push you in different directions. As a resident, I can speak to that because that's what we do um, as a residency director. Depending on where you're training, um, you will either be assigned a mentor or you will be sort of compelled to find your own mentor. And I think either pathway is fine. Um, but I definitely agree this is not a you know, this is my buddy that I'm going to go have a beer with after my shift on Friday. This is someone that's going to really help you and mold you and push you to get to the next level. And some of their advice might be hard to hear sometimes, but they're doing that for what's best for you. Um, I also agree it's a two-way street, and you may be, it may be more beneficial for you as um, the junior person to actually set the next meeting, come in with an agenda. It's not a passive relationship, right? Because that's the way that you're going to be the, get the most out of your mentoring and um, to get the most with your career. So I will finish up here and Ben, feel free to tell me to shut up because I could talk about this for the entire session because this is a uh, big passion of mine. But uh, I think there's some Im important things that um, I think you should take away from a, a mentor-mentee relationship. I personally um, am against sort of the, the forced or arranged mentorship model. 99% of them don't work. Um, sometimes you get lucky and you're matched up with someone that you jive with and you have similar interests, but for the, for the vast majority of, of cases, that doesn't work. It's something that you have to, to seek out. 
and you have to be engaged. So I think as a resident, as a junior faculty member, as a medical student, you have to be engaged when you approach your mentor. I, w I would advise you not to say, will you be my mentor, check yes or no. That doesn't go over very well and it's weird and awkward. Um, I would say, you know, you, I, I really admire your paper on X, Y, and Z. Tell me more about that. How can, I, how can I institute that in my residency or how can I institute that in our department? Then you've asked the question, you've shown engagement and that makes the person more, more engaged in the relationship from the start. I think you have to make sure that you're being persistent and not tailing off in your communication. That's important as well. I think it's also important that this doesn't have to be someone at your institution. While that's great and they're far easier to communicate with face to face at times, we have uh, digital media that makes people from around the globe that you can admire available 24-7, 365. Time zones don't matter, geography doesn't matter. You can have face-to-face -face meetings by technology. I think that's important as well. And I think it's important to have multiple mentors. So there's not an individual that is good at everything. I think the last one of those was Leonardo da Vinci and there hasn't been one since. So you wanna have, some, you wanna have a, a mentorship board of directors or a mentorship group. So someone that's good that you admire at research that you jive with, someone that you admire their educational practices that you jive with, someone who you admire their wellness, their clinical care, et cetera. I think it's important that you have someone in those various domains you can go to when you have questions in those specific areas. Awesome. Yeah, let me amplify on that a little bit. And I do think that people think that you're supposed to have one mentor and you're not. You're supposed to have many. Um, and then I think the other thing that, you know, you really need and you really need to think about, particularly junior faculty, is um, certainly whether or not this person could actually be a sponsor for you as opposed to a mentor. Um, and sponsors are people that, you know, nominate you for things and open doors um, in a way that, that mentors don't. Mentors are more um, in that kind of coaching, helping to, you know, push you into, um, into being your best self. And then sponsors say, yeah, that's pretty good. I think you could fit here. Um, and then really actually propel you into that space. And to the point of being persistent, I think that's absolutely important. And I would say when I think about that, I'd think persistent and steady um, and not necessarily demanding. Most of the people that you'll be working with in that space are going to be busy. Um, and, you know, if you've set a timeline, then you need to adhere to it and really roll through that and not show up at the last minute and then be, quote, you know, really like, okay, I'm ready. And you need to turn it and realizing that the person on the other side of that, I, you know, if it's me, I've got a gazillion other things to do. And so, you know, you've got to be able to give that person enough time to actually process it and turn it around and get it back to you. So be thoughtful about that as well and how you communicate um, with, with folks because, it, it, you do need to understand it is respectful of their time. And you also need to be helpful in that space. So when, when you're doing this work, then it's often something that the, the mentor actually also wants to accomplish. And so um, doing that to the highest quality is also um, really important. But don't be afraid to put it out there. Like That's part of what they're going to do is help you make it better. So. And I, I would say to kind of build on that even just a little bit more, um, I would uh, make sure you respect boundaries. Mm. So that's not going to be something that you talk about in your first meeting where you ask them to be your mentor, you check yes or no, awkwardly. That's going to be um, a couple things down the line where you're going to set those boundaries. You, want some, you don't want to send them an email and 30 seconds later send them another email because they haven't responded. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you guys have similar sort of expectations from that regard. Um, some people need to need some time to be more thoughtful and crafting their response. So you just want to make sure you kind of have specific expectations that you kind of both agree to. All excellent advice. Mm -hmm. um, we'll move on to a new topic here. Um, I think residents uh, who are interested in academics get told, oh, you need a niche to succeed. How are you going to uh, find, find your niche? So what do you guys think about that? How should residents uh, really identify what their, uh, their specific area is and, and explore that more? Um, so you want to find something that 
really appeals to you, right? You don't want to be just, oh, I picked this niche because I think it sounds cool, but really I have no interest in it because you're not going to be engaged with any of the work that you do the rest of your career, right? And sometimes it takes a while to figure out what really draws you. You may have ideas when you come in as an intern, this is cool, this is cool, this is cool. I would say take those first couple of years of residency and like actually talk to people that do that kind of work. Figure out what is my life going to be like um, if I do that kind of work. Is this, in, is this these, are these projects things that like I want to keep doing as I move forward um, through my career, take advantage of meetings like this. Um, I, we bring all of our interns to this meeting and I tell them go around, go to the interest group, meet people, go to lectures, go to didactics, go to research pro, uh, uh, posters, and see what like you like, oh, I want to learn more about that, right? We will be able to find you guys somebody to help you in whatever it is that you want to do. It may not be in your own institution, but across the country, and everyone is more than willing to work with um, junior faculty, resident students from outside their own institution if they're doing what that person is interested in doing. Um, so, and the honest truth, sometimes these things change, right? So you don't have to put your money down on something day one of intern year. I can tell you from my career, I walked in, I, well initially I started in surgery, so clearly I was going the wrong direction there. But, um, you know, you, you do something and then I, my interest in, was sort of on like some basic science cardiology research when I was in um, residency and then I ended up in disaster global health for a long time and now I'm kind of went the education pathway from that and now I'm a program director. So. Just what you put down on day one doesn't mean that that's what you have to stick with forever. Find something that you're really passionate about and then run with that. So I, I, I certainly echo what Chrissy said. I mean, things change. Um, and these meetings are, are, are invaluable. I mean, there's all kinds of committee meetings. There's all kinds of interest groups. If you want to explore a committee, we're not going to kick you out of there. Um, because you want to um, listen in and see what's going on in, in education or whatever. Most people are going to welcome you in, um, answer your questions. It's a great place to network. Um, these, these things are, are great to, to really pick the minds of uh, um, some of the successful people in each of the different fields, especially SAEM. There's people from, um, there's great researchers, there's great educators, there's, there's great ultrasonographers, there's great um, people in, in all the different realms. And you know, most people, if you walk up with a specific question um, to start off the conversation, they're going to be more than more than willing to to spend some time and and chat with you about what their day to day is. So. Yeah. So um, I, you got to find something that gives you juice. Mm -hmm. So right. It's um, and there's a great book by that name. Um, in, in case you're interested. Um, but it really is about passion. Like, what do you really care deeply about? What do you want? What do you want to do? What seems fun and cool to you? I completely agree with Chrissy that you have to be, um, you have to find something that you actually care about deeply in order to actually then ha want to do it all the time. Like, the, you know, you want to be able to, you want, you know, the thing that that drives you. You want to be able to say, oh, I just can't, I can't wait to get done with this shift so I can go do my research project. I can't, can't wait to get done with this so I can go back and do this, write this paper. I'm so excited about this that you just, you're just compelled to do it. And so then it doesn't become work. And I know that that seems weird and maybe odd to a lot of people that um, you would be so driven into this other space that you were just, you just wanted to know everything about it. Um, but I think when you find your niche, it's like that um, and you really get into, uh, when you're doing that work, you really are in this state of flow and just so engaged with it, and um, and and just love what you're doing. So th be be thoughtful about about that. And again, don't don't be afraid to change. I mean, just because you you know do some work and and do it well, um, you know you can again transition out. I'm very much of the Montessori school. You know, you have to you know learn by doing. And uh, and so that that I think is is a really the most probably the most important um, way to find your niche. And awesome. you know your niche may not be something that is like I am ultrasound. This is it. You know I mean if someone said you know what's your niche and I said authentic assessment would you know what that is it's like you know uh, no it's but it's something that was very much a derivative of a lot of other work that I was doing based on something I identified clinically started doing this work and then realized that the assessment part of it um, brought out my inner nerd and I just loved it and that was what you know I loved doing and it ultimately propelled me into becoming the curriculum dean for the school of medicine because I understood how to assess and measure competency in learners across multiple different domains using multiple different modalities so you don't 
it, it may not be what's right there on the front end of it. Um, it may be some derivative down the path. So. And, and ultimately, we're, we're good at what we enjoy. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you're, you want to do what you enjoy, so you're going you're gonna to put all of, your, all of your efforts into that, and it's going to be the best product that you can possibly make. Whereas, if you're trying to do a research project just to check off a box in residency, it's going to feel like you're getting poked by needles <laughs> and getting your teeth pulled or something like that. It's awful. Um, you have no desire to get it done. It's just going to be painful. So you want to make sure that you really um, find something that makes you passionate. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so for um, you guys are, are potentially in the, in the roles of uh, interviewing new uh, grads into uh, faculty roles, uh, things like that. What are you looking for as somebody uh, who would be hiring new grads who might be, you know, interested in on the academic track? How can they? How can people uh, kind of stand out? Well, I, I guess I hired 22 people last year, so I'll start with that one. Um, I'm going to hire 22 more this year, people. Indiana's growing. We're big, so come on. We're getting some applications. Um, what I look for is productivity. Um, I do look for evidence of passion. I look for directionality. I look for um, the fact that that person at least has some idea about what they want to do. Um, and uh, no offense, but you know, if you come in and you sit down and you say, well, I really want to teach. Okay, well, okay. Next, you know, because teaching in an academic institution, particularly academic emergency medicine, where the part and parcel of our work is um, bedside clinical education, that is a, a given, right? You're gonna, that, that's, that is part of the job. Like, it, it is absolutely it. Um, so you can, if, so if you don't like to teach, that's probably a, a, a probably approximate neuro signal to you that this academics is not for you, um, unless you're interested in more basic science st kinds of stuff and want to be in a lab. But, so, so that, that is not, that is not a differentiator. Um, and that, that is actually a, com a common thing. So when you when you're then are, are speaking about what it is that you actually want to do, you know, I'm interested in developing a re research career or I really noted that in residency I loved, I loved my bedside teaching and so now my goal is to become whatever, X. I want to go down the pathway to becoming a program director or a medical student educator or um, a master clinical educator. Um, something, like tell me something. Have some directionality that's really important. And the other thing, I'll be frank, that I look for is, is a demonstrated productivity, whether that's in medical school or residency, but particularly in residency. And if you're a fellow and you haven't produced anything, like you haven't produced a paper, you haven't produced a series of podcasts, you haven't produced something, then I'm going to say, well, what have you been doing with your time? Um, and, 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 you know, so you're going to need to be able to say, I've got all these things in the hopper. We've collected primary data on X, Y, or Z, da, 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 in order to kind of mitigate that. But it's going to be a little bit of a red flag. The other thing um, that I really like to know about it, when I'm hiring somebody is, are you a human being? Um, are you a decent person? Do you know that we want to work alongside? Do you fit um, in terms of that um, capacity to make an intellectual contribution outside of the medical aspects of your of your work? I mean, do you really love to play softball? Do you really love to do whatever? I mean, you know, you just tell me something and be a human. Um, I think that's that's also important, but it it won't. Um, you have to be both of those things, I think, ultimately, in order to be successful. So, that's more. Awesome. Agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Agree, 100 <laughs> percent. So, uh, you kind of touched on this uh, a little bit, but residents have a requirement to produce a scholarly project by the end of uh, residency. Uh, mm -hmm. But I feel like people can be a little bit overwhelmed by this, and sometimes they wait until the last minute and just kind of get assigned something. Um, what kinds of scholarly activity do you recommend that residents pursue? What uh, do you think is, is highest yield uh, for uh, somebody who's potentially going to have an academic career? I'll just tell you how we set it up in my shop. Um, sure. Because this is how, this is what we, 
our ideal thing is. What I tell every single intern when they come in, my goal is for you to have an abstract at a national presentation by the time you finish our training program. It's only a three-year program, there's not a lot of time, right? Uh, but I set that goal at the beginning because number one, that gives them something to put on their CV. Number two, they get a chance to go to another national meeting and meet people and network, which is gonna help them um, go down the pathway towards academics if that's where they wanna go. The second thing I tell them is, I want you to do a project in an area that's interesting to you. I'm not going to assign you one, unless we get to this time at their third year, and then, well, they've got six weeks, right? So, um, but for the, for the most part, my, I mean, similar to what Andrew said earlier, we want people to do something they're interested in because they will love it then, and they will find so much more joy out of doing that, and they'll really be able to understand, is this something that I think I wanna do going forward? The way we do that is that, for six months, I tell people just be an intern, figure out where the call room is, figure out how to page somebody, figure out, be comfortable calling yourself Dr. So-and-so, that takes a while, right? Um, and then we all, and at this meeting, we bring all of our interns and they are expected to present at our research dinner um, sort of what their area of interest is and what some ideas they may have for what they wanna do for their scholarship. Our panel of faculty are there that help pair them with people that have similar interests that they can go and meet with them when they get home. And we check in on them every six months at their semi-annual meetings. So do they all hit that expectation of getting an abstract? No, but the ones that do often end up in academics because they feel driven and they're here. We had one resident at six meetings last year. Now, <laughs> running out of money in the department to keep my promise, but, um, <laughs> but I believe that we have to continue to do that. So the people that don't do abstracts, you know, book chapters, things like that, I just tell them, make sure it's something you're interested in or it's gonna be the most painful experience of your residency program. Yeah, so I agree with Chrissy. We do something very similar at uh, Ohio State is we want, you know, we, we take the piece of scholarship of publishable quality, which, I mean, who knows what that even means, really. Um, we kind of push that to um, a national presentation or a peer-reviewed publication. That's kind of our overarching goal. Does everyone meet that? Absolutely not. Um, but I think that's a, that's a goal that, uh, that really helps um, kind of push people um, in that way. And similarly, we have our interns, there's uh, two of them and one of our chiefs right there, I'm gonna call them out, um, who um, we send our first years here to kind of learn what academics is. And I think kind of immersing yourself that first year and um, seeing the research that's presented and the different orals and abstracts and, and all that stuff that's going on um, can kind of say, wow, that's cool, maybe I could do something like that at, um, at Ohio State or, or wherever. And I think that that's, that's super important. And as Chrissy said, it has to be something that you're interested in. It's nice to be the expert and write a book chapter on diarrhea or something like that. But I mean, if you don't like diarrhea, then I mean, sure it looks good on your CV, but why, why waste your time? It's gonna be painful. And it's gonna make you think of all the times that you've had diarrhea. And it's just, you don't, you don't wanna, it may not be the best thing for you. So. You really want to make sure that you do something that you're, in, that you're passionate about, et cetera. Take Jeff Klein, for example. Um, he had a personal story that, um, about PE and DVT that really um, hit home with him. He's devoted his career to, to PE. It really interests him, not only from a physiological standpoint, but also on a personal standpoint. And he's really devoted his career, and everyone in this room knows who, who Jeff Klein is. So, um, you know. Jeff Klein's research team. <laughs> That's good. Thanks for plugging Klein. He's here at IU with me. Um, and so I think the, the, the one thing that, that I would add to this is, you know, if you do have some ambivalence, but you're like, okay, well, I think this could be interesting, just attach yourself to um, a faculty member who's doing a really good project. I mean, you know, you'll find that a lot of times on your shift, you'll see your faculty and they'll go, oh, man, this would be a great idea. This would be cool. We should do this. And, uh, and then you can go, oh, that might be a good, you know, I could say, hey, Paul, this would be a great scholarly project. What do you think? Should we do it? And, you know, and then he can, like, accept or decline. But, you know, it might pique some interest in him. But, but what he's also getting out of that is a relationship. So, I mean, you know, I don't think diarrhea is particularly compelling to anyone <laughs> unless you were in, wanted thought, had really big thoughts of being a gastroenterologist. So maybe you did. <clears throat> so that's maybe another way to kind of drill down and figure out what you, you know, you're kind of internal to emergency medicine because emergency medicine is so broad area of interest is and it's like, oh wow, you know, I really thought about going into otolaryngology 
or surgery. So maybe my project should be somehow related to one of those things because you have already identified that you have a natural um, tendency to like that particular area. So if it's, you know, ENT, then you can say, wow, hmm, what am I really interested in? Maybe it's nosebleeds. I'll, you know, I'll, t I'll learn about more about nosebleeds. But if you don't, and there's a faculty member who's doing some work that you think is cool and that you actually want to have a relationship with, then pair up with that faculty member because most people who have a, um, a robust research stream like Klein, I've got about 15 projects that they can swing off at any given time. I mean, I want you to think about a little kind of a little tree that, you know, well, we could do this and we could do this and I've got the data for this and we could do that. And, you know, you're like, oh, wow. So that's a lot of um, access, if you will, um, not only into the mind of somebody, but what you'll also learn is that capacity to um, pick an area of expertise, begin the process of developing it, and then spinning off other projects off of that that are secondary questions that you might want to answer that are often the perfect size for a resident um, uh, scholarly project. So. so in addition to being the, the first sort of um, primary investigator or first author on a, on a specific project, you can also um, find yourself joining um, all other multiple projects in different domains, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this may be a, kind of a backdoor way that you identify um, a specific niche that you're interested in. So maybe you do a project in medical education and you thought it was awful the entire time you were doing it. Maybe medical education is not for you. And then maybe you, you join a, a project on ultrasound and you were nerding out the entire time, you were thrilled, you wanted to keep working on this all the time. Maybe ultrasound is something that you should consider exploring further. So I think that's kind of a way to, to kind of help you narrow down some of your, your specific interests. Yeah, absolutely. So I promised that uh, I would not just go through uh, the questions that I have pre-prepared, but uh, I want to make sure that your guys' questions uh, get answered also. Um, now that, uh, that we've gotten a few questions under our belts, uh, anybody, anybody have any burning questions at this point? One of the questions I have is regarding uh, after residency and as a junior faculty, I think some of the time we get shift by down to do our research, which a lot of us really look forward to, but at the same time we're trying to balance making sure we are solid in our clinical activity and making sure as a, as a new faculty um, we are very confident in our abilities there. So how do you balance your interest in research as well as the clinical aspect that which many of us really love and want to make sure we keep up. Excellent. Well, I think you know you have to have that frank, very frank conversation with your chair, and you need to be able to prepare to say, you know, I'm I want to be, you know, aggressive clinically, and I think honestly, I think that's a, a great idea. I was trained. Um, and hired by Judy Tintinelli. And so um, Judy, much to my chagrin, um, wouldn't give anybody any protected time in the first year that was done. You have to just be a clinician. In your first year, that's what you do. Um, and, you know, I was like, oh my God, I just, you know, I really want to do this, that, or the other. And nope, you're going to, this is what you're going to do. Well, what that did was it made me a really good and efficient doctor in the department so that then when I actually began the process of pulling back um, and getting more protected time for my work, I was actually able to um, still feel very comfortable with it. It wasn't kind of catching up. And so I, I think that's one strategy. The other, I mean, you know, and you don't necessarily even have to do that for a year. Um, you know, if you do that for um, just the first six months, you're just like, okay, I'm going to come in, I'm going to be full-time clinical for the first six months, and then I'm going to pick up my protected time. That's often very helpful to you as well because it allows you to, again, you figure everything out, you feel very comfortable, and then you can start and you're slightly off cycle, um, which is also a very useful thing. The other thing is building a mixed model job, which is something that we are exploring here um, at IU and we've had great success in our recruitment, um, which is recognizing that people who are coming out really want to see a lot of patients and they want to see them, they need to see them, a lot of them actually independently. So there's two sets of things that actually need to happen with that. Um, you can either work downtown in our quote tertiary slash quaternary care academic um, health centers and work um, a disproportionate number of what we would call the SWAT shifts where you see patients independently 
um, but those are often somewhat lower acuity, or we can give you a percentage of your time in the community. And that is kind of a triple win. So if I give you 25% of your time in the community, you're going to see patients primarily. You might have a medical student associated with you, then 75% of your time downtown. Then you can, you know, exercise the muscles of, you know, bedside clinical teaching and overseeing residents and all those um, other kinds of things. So that that is um, a, a helpful and it's kind of a win because the community docs make more. Um, so you get a little bolus of cash up front as well because you're making a little more um, by working in the community and then you actually then, you know, can parlay that into, into you know, your full-time academic gig as you move forward. Um, the other thing that we do for junior faculty is that we kind of recognize that we spend a ton of time teaching you how to be a good medical student, teaching you medicine, and then we spend a very ton of time teaching you how to be a good resident, and then we pat you on the back and say, good luck, have a great time as a faculty member, it's going to be awesome, you're going to love it. Um, and that's a very stressful time, it's a big uptick. So we've created a... Um, uh, in-house faculty development program called EM Jams, which is Jump Start in Academic Medicine. It meets monthly. You're cohorted with your peers. You actually then get the opportunity to go over some of the materials that that we think are important that help you just understand the lay of the land in terms of what an academic career might look like. What does it look like to publish? How do you deal with some conflict resolution? We do a little bit of stuff on, honestly, on finance pretty early on so that people understand the money that they're getting and how it should be distributed and what their options are. Um, then, you know, uh, I mean, it's all the basic things that you need to understand. Promotion, what is tenure, all of that stuff that nobody ever really goes over with you. So, and then we go over some real specific skills that we think are very focused on being an excellent academician, how to give a good talk, do you know how to, um, you know, critique a paper, how to actually give meaningful feedback to residents in a way that is actually uh, useful to, to the learner and will make you a valued colleague for them. So all of that stuff is ha kind of happening simultaneously in that first year. So I would say I wouldn't be afraid to back off of, um, you know, your uh, protected time or research in that first year if that's possible. If you're entering into a K program or something like that, that's probably not going to work. But I will also tell you that um, if somebody's giving you protected time and then you're overworking on the other side, then they're going to say, hmm, maybe you don't need that much protected time because you're over here doing all this clinical work. So just the thought. <laughs> yeah, so I, I agree that uh, the mixed model um, is, a, is a good thing as a, as a junior faculty member. I actually spent a year in the community and then uh, came back to Ohio State. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really think that uh, seeing patients on your own is great. I don't think you necessarily need to go into the community like I did initially um, in order to succeed in academics. Um, but I do think it's, it's certainly helpful to see patients on your own because um, you really um, shouldn't have that opportunity in residency, um, and you really <laughs> shouldn't have that opportunity in residency. Um, so you you want to make sure that you have the opportunity to see patients on your own and really identify your practice style. Make sure your your skills are sharp. Um, and I think the the mixed model, which is which is basically present in the vast majority of of academic centers now, I think is very valuable. I'm at a place where we don't have a mixed model, um, and I will tell you, um, I have this conversation with graduating third years, I'm taking it a little different direction all the time. They think, well, I, I don't think I can go be in academics because I need to really hone my skills. And I'm like, you guys have to trust your training, right? And you have no perspective because you only know where you work and you don't know how good you really are, um, which is why I'm a big proponent of fellowships, um, because I tell residents that is your time, that one or two years for you to really like actually have some selfish time to develop what you want to do from your sort of academic interests, but then you're also often practicing on your own. So you kind of get both win-win, and I think you come into an academic position in such a different, um, with such a different breadth of experience having done a fellowship than if you go straight out of residency. And things are shifting. I think that the days of walking into academic jobs right out of residency are moving away. I think uh, fellowships are becoming much more popular and I think they're more attractive sometimes for chairs because they have someone that comes in with some previous experience that's going to kind of put them at a different level than the re just recent graduate. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Awesome. Any other questions from the audience? 
we got more up here, but uh, <laughs> all right. Feel free to uh, interrupt. Raise your hand at any time. Um, what mistakes have you seen uh, residents make who are, uh, you know, potentially interested in going down the uh, academic path, but trip up some, uh, somewhere along the way, either during residency, during the application process, uh, early in their career? Do you mean like trip up from like a academic stand, like a? they get in trouble? <laughs> like, I, <don't> <laughs> I, I mean, I think more in terms of like bad moves uh, ah, career-wise. Yes, I can do that one for you. Um, so I think that you know, we tell you guys, hey, come to these meetings, meet people, get to know them, work on their projects, right? And that is really helpful. The one mistake I've seen by a few residents, don't get too familiar, right? So don't be the person that's in this room, that's in the back of the room with the scotch in their hand making comments all the time like they're a you know, 85-year-old Season professor like that don't do that because immediately people then start to notice you and they pay attention to you and they pay attention to you in a way that you don't want to be paid attention to right so stay professional um, I think that that's a mistake that I've seen some residents make and because you don't want to lose your credibility at the get the you know the very beginning of the game um, and finish what you commit to right so if you sign up for something if you're on a project and if you like are the person that no one can get a hold of you don't complete your stuff on time then you're going to get that reputation and that'll stick with you. So be professional and stick to what you, what you sign up for. I would add don't overcommit um, because then everything you do is either of poor quality or you don't get it done as uh, Chrissy was saying. And uh, from someone who made this mistake and uh, went to the community initially, um, make sure you identify a mentor and uh, that, you, that you trust and make sure that uh, you really understand what academics is as a career. I had no idea um, what academics was. I had a big, I was in a three-year residency in a big academic institution and I was uh, um, too silly not to really um, delve into what academics really is. So I think you really need to make sure that you identify that for yourself that means different things at different places. Um, scholarship is, is promoted differently at different places. Um, Education is promoted differently at different places. So I think you really, you really have to, to kind of get a firm grasp as to what academics really is. Yeah, and, and don't get trapped by herd mentality either. I mean, every class seems to have their um, personality. And and then everybody in that class, it seems like they want to do exactly the same thing or very close, you know. And so if you are feeling something different, don't, don't doubt yourself in that space. If you think that, you know, you really want to do something else, then, like I said, don't doubt yourself and, and dare to be different um, and get out there and, and explore and develop that part of yourself in a way that might be different than what your classmates are doing. So. Awesome. Um, do you guys have a sense of uh, what resources within SAM uh, can be helpful to residents as they think about pursuing an academic career, um, think about uh, their options during residency for uh, getting involved with uh, projects, with committees, uh, things like that? I can, I can speak for So there's several things that are available. So there is um, a research sort of program called ARMED that you can learn uh, sort of specific research skills and uh, kind of develop that um, even in residency. Um, there is a upcoming um, academic roadmap similar to our title of our talk that's going to be um, edited and published here soon by the uh, SAM um, RAMS board. There is um, an academic career guide um, that has been recently updated and will be published to the website um, as well from um, the SAM committees. So there's, there's plenty of, of different um, opportunities. You just really have to, you know, they're all on the website at this point except for the couple that are still being edited and will be up here in the next few months. I think, you know, the um, interest groups are also really, really, really um, a great resource for residents because you can get in there with a group of like-minded people and they're almost always going to be developing a project. And if they don't have a project, then maybe you should have one in your mind, a little inkling of a project that you'd like to do. And then, again, that gives you some synergy. It helps you build networks. I think the real value of the organization, not only um, to be able to 
you know, talk about your to your work, but it is to be able to build networks of colleagues that actually have similar interests um, and and hopefully then a diverse skill sets, which are going to make all your work stronger. So I think that being involved and being active in the society is really probably its greatest single asset. Excellent. Um, how should residents decide where to devote their efforts? I mean, I think this gets back to a little bit to some of the points we've touched on uh, before. Um, but, uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of, of opportunity. There's the sense that you can't say yes to everything. Um, so what should, what should people say yes to and what should people politely decline? As, as a resident, say yes to things that are interesting to you. You know what I mean? If somebody wants you to, well, like I said, if you're at the end of your residency and you haven't figured it out yet, you may have to just do what you need to do. But if you're early on or you've got an idea of what you want to do, say yes. Put yourself in positions where you can say yes to things that like, you're like, oh, I'm really compelled and excited to do this. Um, I think you'll just find so much more joy in your work by doing that. Um, I don't know that residents face as much as junior faculty do the, the, the too many options to say yes. I think if you put yourself out there, then all of a sudden you may be in that situation, right? And that's a nice situation to be in. Uh, but at the beginning, Sign up for stuff that's fun, that's exciting to you, that you think is going to be like something you want to learn more about. And like we've all said, if it's not the right thing, then just switch on to something else. That's okay. I don't think any chair, when they're looking to hire someone, is going to be like, oh, during residency, your intern year looked like you're interested in this, and then your projects moved to this. I think showing that you're interested in being productive is more important necessarily than what that individual thing is. Um, well, I think our time is uh, about up here. Um, I want to thank our uh, panelists for um, spending their time with us today. Um, th this was great. I learned a lot, uh, I feel like, at, uh, at this too. So uh, if you guys could give a big hand to our, uh, to our panelists here.